I appreciate being here and I want to thank you and, and Stephanie as well. And I'd also like to give a shout out to some friends and relatives and former colleagues at CIA who I believe are uh, here tonight as well. So thank you all. Uh, this is an historic year and it's also an historic day. Of course, this is the centennial year when women finally achieved the, the right to vote. And today, of course, is also Pearl Harbor Remembrance Day. You know, a day of sacrifice where over 2,400 service men and women lost their lives. And December 7th, 1941 also brought us into World War II. But there was already an American uh, in the war uh, prior to uh, December 7th, 1941 making sacrifices uh, to fight Nazi Germany. And that was a disabled woman from Baltimore working behind enemy lines in France uh, as a, a spy for the allies. And today I'm gonna be talking about that woman, uh, Virginia Hall, who I call America's greatest spy of the second world war. I'm gonna break this talk into three parts, how I came to write the book, about Virginia Hall, tell a little bit about Virginia Hall's life and career in espionage, uh, and if time allows, uh, talk about how my wife and I discovered uh, Virginia Hall's uh, freedom trail, the one that she used through the Pyrenees in the winter of 1942 to escape the Gestapo, and specifically Klaus Barbie, who was known as the Butcher of Lyon. Uh, and after that, I'll uh, open it up and we'll have an opportunity for some questions and, and hopefully some good answers. <laughs> um, uh, Patricia mentioned my career at, at CIA. Uh, a number of people who think about working at CIA mean they think that, you know, you must have been a spy. Well, I wasn't a spy. I was, uh, I was a, a senior manager and also mostly a writer. Uh, uh, Patricia mentioned that I was chief speechwriter for, for several directors. Uh, being a writer allows you to move in a variety of different kinds of circles within uh, an organization. And I really had a chance to work with, I would say, um, a number of the different directorates at CIA. So I have a, a pretty good understanding of espionage through osmosis. Um, I also uh, had an opportunity to travel extensively to war zones, including war zones, Iraq and Afghanistan. So I've seen some of our young officers uh, in action. Um, I retired in 2013. I became a part-time consultant uh, with CIA's history staff, uh, where I worked on document declassification. And that is kind of where I came into contact with Virginia Hall's file. Uh, at the same time, I was going back to school. Uh, as Patricia mentioned, I was working on a master's in writing at Hopkins, and I needed a thesis topic. Uh, and that's when I recalled uh, taking a look at Virginia Hall's file and her story came to mind. And the more research that I did, the more interesting I became in her life. And I talked to my professors about it who had never heard of Virginia Hall before. Uh, and they were very enthusiastic. They liked my writing and they said, you really should kind of continue to write a book about Virginia Hall. And that's in fact what I did. Uh, I think we wanna be on slide two now, uh, Stephanie. Uh, are we on the slide? Bear with me for just a second. I didn't hear the cue for the slides okay. yet. That's, that's so <laughs> the, first, the first picture is a picture actually of Virginia Hall at yeah. age 26. Uh, it was taken from her so passport. That's the be up here picture. momentarily. Yeah, that's the picture of Virginia Hall passport photo of her. Okay, this is uh, this is slide two. That's that's correct. Uh, Recently, it seems like the public has really kind of grabbed onto Virginia Hall's story as well, and her, her popularity you know, continues to rise. I started my book about six years ago, and I thought I had cornered the story. Um, there, <clears throat> there had only been two other books about Virginia Hall written in, in the two decades prior to, uh, uh, prior to my starting to write on it. Uh, one was Wolves at the Door by uh, Judith Pearson, and the other one was La Spawn, Virginia Hall, which is a French biography that was written by uh, Vincent Nuzel. Um, but midway through my research, I found that there were two other uh, authors who were working on books about Virginia Hall at exactly the same time. Uh, in addition to Hall of Mirrors, Sonia Purnell was working on a book called A Woman of No Importance. And Don Mitchell had a book, uh, The Lady is a Spy, uh, that he had just uh, completed as well. 
uh, to my great relief, I found out that these books really weren't in competition uh, with each other. They, they had a synergy of, of sorts uh, because uh, Sonia's A Woman of No Importance is really a biography. She's, a, uh, she's a, uh, a journalist and she did a great job in researching it. So it's a straight biography. Uh, the Ladies a Spy by uh, Don Mitchell, who actually worked for the National Security Council, uh, is, uh, is, uh, is a, actually a YA book, a young adult book. And uh, my book, though, it's based on hundreds of, of uh, documents from uh, the US and British archives and, and elsewhere, is a work of historical fiction, which means basically that um, I wrote it in first person. Uh, so that Virginia Hall is telling her own story in the book. <clears throat> there are also two movies currently uh, in, in production. Actually, one of them is already out. Uh, uh, a Call to Spy, which is written and acted by Sarah Megan Thomas, playing the role of Virginia Hall, is out on uh, in the movie theaters as well as uh, it's streaming. Uh, if you wait until the 11th of, uh, of uh, this month, I think you can see it for free uh, via, uh, via um, Amazon Prime. Uh, <clears throat> there's a second movie coming out. It's been delayed by COVID, I believe, uh, based on Sonia Purnell's book, A Woman of No Importance. It's supposed to star Daisy Ridley of Star Wars fame. Uh, that that movie is somehow in, uh, in production somewhere. Um, COVID again, it's kind of screwed things up. It's still slated for uh, release next year. Uh, so it's not surprising really that the, the public has found Virginia Hall. It's a, her story is a great story. And it's a story really that whose time has come. But Virginia as a true spy who lived in the shadows, if she were still alive, she would have been probably appalled by all the publicity that's taking place right now. Uh, next slide, please, Stephanie. Great. Okay, this is a picture of Boxhorn Farm. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about who Virginia Hall was. Uh, she was born in 1906, and by all accounts, she had a very happy childhood. Uh, she belonged to a family of risk takers, and that rubbed off on Virginia. Her grandfather was a, an Irishman who, at age nine, had stowed away on a clipper ship and uh, it was bound for Baltimore, and uh, he rose to be chairman of the Baltimore Gas and Electric Company, a very powerful man. Her father was a real estate entrepreneur who owned a, a string of uh, movie theaters. So this kind of entrepreneurial, kind of risk-taking, adventurous kind of life kind of rubbed off on Virginia too, as we'll see a little bit later on. Uh, so growing up, she had a charmed uh, life. She grew up in an upper a class family, and she lived on this 110 acre boxhorn farm home uh, right on the outside of Baltimore. Uh, she and her family took uh, this, their summers overseas and, and uh, spent a lot of time in Europe as well. Uh, next slide, please, Stephanie. This is a, a picture of uh, Virginia's yearbook. Uh, growing up, Virginia attended the exclusive Roland Park Country Day School. At that point, it was for girls. Uh, she was a good but not great student, uh, but she had a passion to lead. Uh, she was class president, she was editor of the yearbook, captain of the field hockey team. But what caught my attention in taking a look at Virginia's background was that she loved to act in school plays. She liked uh, the role of hiding behind characters and it became, a, I think, a, a good uh, exercise and, and training for the, a life of espionage. Lorna Catling, who was Virginia's niece and uh, last relative basically who knew Virginia, uh, said that uh, Virginia always liked to play the role of the pirate chief. She, she found a freedom in being hidden. Uh, Virginia's high school yearbook uh, called her the most original. She had a streak of boldness and independence and she found a freedom in being hidden. Uh, she was rebellious. Uh, in later years, she refused to take required classes at Bar Barnard and Radcliffe. Uh, in fact, it was gym class of all things that she refused to take. And uh, she, was, she, was, she either dropped out or was expelled. Uh, Lorna told me later on that uh, Virginia had a personality that was a little scary. Uh, nothing seemed to daunt her. She was a very 
a very powerful, very uh, persuasive person, even in her early, early life. After leaving Radcliffe, Virginia traveled to Europe, took classes in Grenoble and Paris, uh, and she graduated from the Consular Academy in Vienna, Austria. And along the way, she seemed to have a facility for languages. Uh, she picked up eventually five of them, French and German and Russian, Italian and Spanish, in addition to her, her native tongue, English. Uh, but Virginia's ambition was never really uh, to be a spy. In the 1930s, after she had graduated from the Consular Academy, uh, she became a clerk uh, that was at that point was a very normal kind of womanly kind of activity working in the State Department, but she had grander ambitions. Her goal was to be an ambassador. Uh, but in the 1930s, that was many thought that that was a silly and impossible dream because of the 2000 uh, employees in the US Foreign Service, there were only six women and there were no women ambassadors. Uh, still, uh, it, it shows you how undeterred uh, Virginia was uh, when she had planned to take the Foreign Service examination. She took it one time and failed, but she was planning on taking it again. Uh, but that, unfortunately, disaster struck. Uh, can we have the next slide, Stephanie? Uh, so it was in December of 1933, Virginia was hunting birds in the Geddes Delta of Turkey. She was climbing over a barbed wire fence. She tripped, her gun discharged, uh, it struck her ankle and foot. And when gangrene set in, uh, the doctors removed the left, her, a good portion of her left leg right below the, uh, the knee. Uh, she was fitted with a wooden appendage, very similar to what you see in the, in the slide right here. Now, wooden appendages in the 1930s were pretty crude. They were wooden, had very little articulation. And this, for Virginia, was more like an anchor. It weighed seven or 10 pounds. And it was really not meant for, for serious walking. It was really meant to, to hold somebody in a stable, upright position. It took about a year for Virginia to recuperate, but to add insult to injury, Virginia was barred from taking the Foreign Service examination because the State Department had discriminatory rules about people with amputations joining the Foreign Service. <laughs> As you can imagine, Virginia was really distraught about this. She fought it hard. She had friends in high places who actually took it to uh, President Roosevelt. Uh, and he contacted uh, Secretary of State Cordell Hull, but Cordell Hull wouldn't be moved. He said, no, there's no way that we're going to have Virginia Hall is in, in the Foreign Service or allow her to take the Foreign Service examination. Um, so Virginia was totally disgusted by this whole situation. She quit the State Department and started to travel to Europe. And that's where her real education started. She lived in France, again, picked up all these different kinds of languages. Uh, she began to understand the culture and the history and the geography of the region. So she became a real uh, Francophile. Uh, in the, now this was the late 1930s. Uh, she was there during a time of real tumult in, in Europe. Uh, it was a time of course of Hitler's rise to power. And when the Nazis invaded France in June in 1940, Virginia was driving an ambulance for the French military. Uh, and when Paris fell, uh, <clears throat> Virginia fled Paris and went to what was ground zero of the war at that time. Instead of going home, she went to, to London where the Battle of Britain was currently underway. Uh, next slide, Stephanie, please. It was in London where Virginia caught the attention of the British intelligence service. They're what they call their newly formed Special Operations Executive, which was designed by Churchill to set Europe ablaze uh, with spies and, and, uh, and espionage. Um, uh, people didn't realize, people today don't realize how close the Brits were to losing the war. And uh, their back was against the wall early on. They were desperately looking for the United States to enter, of course, and it wasn't until, you know, between you know, until 1941 and late 1941 when the U.S. entered. Uh, and people, in fact, U.S. diplomats back in Paris or, or in Vichy, France, 
were were cabling back to the United States saying, you know, the uh, UK is done for. You know, it was really a very difficult time for them. So the Brits were looking basically for people willing to take dangerous assignments, to, to live among the enemy and report back. And, and Virginia was a prime recruit because she was a risk taker. Uh, she knew these languages. She had a knowledge of the customs and the, and the geography. She was independent and fearless. And she was especially attractive to the Brits because she had a US passport. At that time, again, the US was a neutral in the war. So Virginia with her US passport and acting undercover as a stringer for uh, the New York Post could travel all around France and ask uh, a number of different kinds of questions of leading uh, political and military uh, figures at the time and report all that information back to the Brits. So Virginia was a very, very uh, desirable uh, agent uh, for them. Um, and uh, let's, let's go to the next slide. Now, they wanted Virginia to be a, a, a spy for them and, it, and uh, she in fact became the first American to live behind the lines in Vichy, France. It was August of 1940 when she went over. She was operating solo, it, was, it took enormous courage. She had no backup, very little training and before she went in, there were very few airplane drops for her so she had no equipment. So she was basically on her own in, in hostile territory reporting back. Her first mission was codenamed Geologist 5. She was told to be eyes and ears only for three months, but she stayed far beyond her charter. She stayed for, for the first time for 15 months and she organized resistance groups, coordinated jailbreaks, planned uh, sabotage operations and reported back to the Brits. So she went far beyond what they expected her to do. And they were just, of course, delighted with, what, what, with her capabilities and, and how she could, uh, could help them in the war effort. But those, uh, <clears throat> those who are involved in, in the world of espionage know that the longer that you stay in a hostile environment and the more spies that you have under your wing, the more likely it, it will be that you'll be discovered. And Virginia was discovered and she was betrayed. Um, her name was given to Klaus Barbie, the butcher of Lyon, who was responsible for uh, the deaths of 25,000 French men, women, and children. And in hunting Virginia, he is reported to have said, I'd give anything to get my hands on that limping bitch. Next slide, please. So Virginia had to get out of France. Uh, this was November of 1942. The allies had just invaded North Africa and the Nazis were retreating to what had been the unoccupied zone where Virginia was uh, holed out. Uh, the Gestapo now had a free hand to begin rooting out uh, the allied spies with all of these Germans coming back. Uh, the, the, the tissue of, of being unoccupied uh, had been torn away and now all of France was being occupied by the Germans. Virginia wanted to leave Marseille by boat, but that became impossible because all of the fleeing Germans were, were flooding through the Mediterranean and going back to, to France. So the Mediterranean was positively swarming with patrol craft. Uh, the only exit for Virginia was over the Pyrenees to freedom in Spain. Uh, the French uh, Secret Service told Virginia that she was on the Gestapo's wanted list and she only had two hours basically to get ready. And that means destroying documents, uh, packing up, telling your agents uh, that you're moving on. Uh, it was, she had to get out of the way really, really quickly. And she left uh, Lyon for the Pyrenees and taking the last train, 11 p.m. train. Uh, and it was just in time because the next morning her agents in Lyon were beginning to be rolled up and arrested. So Klaus Barbie was hot on the trail, uh, chasing Virginia to the snow-capped Pyrenees where Virginia began her trek in the winter of 1942. 
Um, this is a picture that my wife and I took uh, at, on the top of Col de Montet, which is looking towards, looking to, from France, looking towards Spain. You can see a little bit of a, um, a, a trail from the lower right-hand corner. Now, Virginia went over this mountain uh, and we're taking a look at the trail that she took and it's, and it's leading up into um, uh, Pic de la Dona and uh, the Pyrenees uh, towards Spain. Now you can see that uh, this was in basically in the spring of 2017 when my wife and I took this trip. Uh, and you can see that there was still snow in the mountains. Well, in the winter of 1942, um, there would have been snow all over the place. And this track that, that Virginia took, she was climbing over mountains that were 10,000 feet uh, in elevation and higher, uh, dragging her prosthetic leg uh, 50 miles, three days over unbelievable, tra uh, unbelievable terrain. So uh, I have some pictures later on that I'll, I'll be showing you uh, and telling you a little bit about how my wife and I discovered the Freedom Trail that Virginia Hall used. But, but this, is, this gives you an idea of of the kind of magnitude of the, of, the, of the trail. And this trail that you see leading from the lower right-hand corner is, is not a flat trail. Uh, that trail is a fairly steep trail. Uh, and she would have already climbed over the mountain that, that I'm taking the picture from right now in order to, in order to wend her way uh, through the Pyrenees to, uh, to freedom in Spain. Now, as I mentioned, uh, she took this, this trail uh, in, the, in November of 1942 through the snow and through the ice, three days, 50 miles. Um, she arrived in Spain on the 12th of November in 1942, but it wasn't the end of or her ordeal. After the three day trek, uh, she arrived early to the train station, which is kind of a rookie mistake for, uh, for a spy. You're never supposed to arrive early at, at any kind of an appointment. Um, and she also lacked an Entrada stamp in her passport, uh, an entrance stamp in, in Spain. So um, she arrived at the train station. The police there, you know, milling around, picked her up and said, okay, let's see, take a look at your passport. They knew that she had arrived illegally in Spain and threw her in Spanish jail. Uh, <clears throat> she was there for six weeks uh, and it, it took that long for the Americans and the Brits, her spy masters, to come in and to pick her up. Now, at this point, most of us would say, I've, I've had enough. It's time to go home. You know, I mean, Klaus Barbie's chasing me and, and all of these people, you know, the, my leg is, is, uh, is hard, feels horrible after it's been uh, through this ordeal. But no, Virginia demanded to go back to France. Um, the the Brits, however, said, you're not going back with us. The, you know, the Butcher of Lyon is still after you. Uh, they're, they're posters, wanted posters all around France. There's a bounty on your head. Um, and the cardinal, one of the cardinal rules of espionage is basically you can't, agents can't go back to the, the place where they were burned. So the Brits said, no, there's no way that we're gonna be allowing you to go back. You, sure, you can, you can hang out with us and you know, brief the boys before they go over, but Virginia wouldn't have any of that. Uh, she was determined to go back to France. And I think one of the reasons why she wanted to go back to France was to, to make amends for her agents that uh, she, left, she left them in the lurch. And uh, uh, there's this very special relationship between um, case officers and their agents. Uh, and uh, I, I, I feel very strongly that she wanted to go back, not only because she felt that she could, she could do something positive and that she was very well placed to uh, to, to help the Allied cause, but she wanted to find out what happened to her agents and to help them in any degree that she could. Now, the Brits said, no, you're not going back. Uh, but she went to the new American spy organization, the Office of Strategic Services, and offered her, offered her service. Uh, while Bill Donovan, who was the head of OSS, uh, <clears throat> was in a bind. D-Day was fast approaching. OSS was a very new organization. They were learning a lot from the Brits about how to do espionage and spy ops and, you know, and, and do all the sabotage operations and things like that. But they basically still had their training wheels on. 
Uh, so uh, when Virginia came to them, uh, Donovan, who only had three agents in France at the time, he, he said, sure, yeah, we, we'd love to have you come and, and be part of our organization. So, Fran so <clears throat> Virginia did in fact uh, go back to, uh, to France. Uh, next slide, Stephanie, please. Virginia made herself even more desirable by becoming a wireless operator. So she did in fact uh, return on the eve of the D-Day invasion. She helped to organize and equip the McKee. She led over 1500 resistance fighters and to blow up bridges and communications networks and fuel depots, all of these things um, to prevent the German reinforcements from reaching the Normandy beaches uh, at D-Day. Uh, and in doing so, Virginia helped to secure the success of the D-Day invasion. Uh, next slide, please, Stephanie. Uh, at war's end, Virginia received uh, some of the highest accolades that the Allies could bestow. She was awarded the MBE, the member of the British Empire, uh, the Croix de Guerre. Uh, she was the only US woman, the only woman actually to, uh, in World War II to receive the Distinguished Service Cross. But with all her honors, she refused to have a public ceremony. And even with the a Distinguished Service Cross presentation, which was supposed to be given by President Truman, um, she refused the public ceremonies. Uh, she feared it would blow her cover and she wanted to continue to serve as clandestine officer. Uh, next slide, please. Virginia got her chance uh, to resume her espionage when she joined the newly created CIA in, uh, in 1951. Uh, Virginia became one of the first female clandestine officers in what was then known as the Plans Directorate, but now it's known as the Operations Directorate. Uh, she planned political and psychological operations against newly installed communist governments in, in Europe and Latin America. Uh, she was a trailblazer, but it wasn't really a happy time for her. She was behind a desk and the world was changing. The hot war had turned cold and it required a really a different kind of a skill set. Um, the way ops officers get promoted is being, by being overseas, and uh, Virginia took very few extended trips. Uh, she stayed largely back at Langley uh, doing, doing desk work. Uh, and it seems that some of the characteristics that made her invisible and successful in wartime, her gender and her disability also kind of worked against her uh, in peacetime because they made her invisible to an organization that wasn't paying attention to, uh, to women or people with disabilities either. Um, in the 1950s, when Virginia was there, there was institutionalized discrimination. Uh, women's ops officers could only rise to the level of GS-14, while men could rise to GS-17. So ultimately, I think they squandered her talents. Uh, they didn't know what to do with her. And uh, Personally, I think they probably should have made her head of operations training, uh, but they didn't do that. Uh, they, they kind of pushed her aside. Uh, next slide, please. So Virginia retired in, in 1966 at age 60 uh, on disability. Uh, it, but in 1957, she had married OSS officer Paul Goyot, seen in this picture, um, who had parachuted. He, he was a member of the OSS who had parachuted uh, into the Haute Loire region near the end of the war. In fact, it was kind of interesting. <clears throat> uh, Virginia had already kind of mopped up uh, the Haute Loire region when, uh, when Team Jeremy, which, which uh, Paul Goyot was a member of, uh, dropped in. You know? So it, they, they kind of came in after the fact and kind of did a little bit of sweep up, but they really didn't do too much because Virginia had already kind of uh, cleared, the, cleared the lanes. Um, but uh, Virginia and Paul, hit it off and they got married in 1957 uh, and they moved to a 40 acre farm right outside of Barnesville, Maryland, uh, where Virginia raised a garden uh, and also uh, French poodles. Uh, Virginia died uh, at, in 1982 at the age of 76. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, the, uh, how my wife and I discovered uh, the, the Freedom Trail that Virginia Hall had uh, taken in the winter of 1942. So if, if uh, Stephanie, if you'll take the next 
Slide, please. Um, I was challenged by my professor at Johns Hopkins when I was working my uh, working on my thesis uh, to to walk Virginia Hall's trail, and, but there was only one problem: nobody knew where the trail was. Uh, so uh, my wife and I made two trips uh, to try to locate Virginia's trail through the Pyrenees. Uh, we went to France in May of 2017, and then Spain uh, in August of, of 2019. Uh, we arrived in France with only a paragraph from a book. This was the Vincent Nuzel book that I had mentioned earlier. Uh, and he was an early biographer of Hall. Um, there was only one paragraph about the trail. It was written in French and it offered very few clues. I don't read French. My wife Janet reads French. So I, I relied on her heavily to give me uh, some instruction on this. Um, we started off uh, going to a museum, we thought this was a logical way to start, uh, to a museum in saint Jerome's that, that was dedicated to freedom trails. <clears throat> it was a one room building, uh, had a lot of glass cases and books with red lines going from one direction to another. And <clears throat> I talked to the woman behind the counter who spoke very little English. I talked about Virginia Hall. She didn't know Virginia Hall. I talked about Vincent Nuzel's book. She didn't know Vincent Nuzel. I, I gave her a, a section of Vincent Nuzel's book that talked about the, uh, you know, the trail. She didn't know anything about that either. Um, so we kind of hit a roadblock there. So we, uh, we, our best option I think had been exhausted. So the, the only thing that we really could do was to, to go to uh, uh, Villa France de Conflet, which is the beginning of uh, Virginia Hall's book. And, uh, and just kind of go there and see what we could see what we could find. Uh, so we did what tourists normally do. We, uh, we went to the town's information center and I asked and we were met with a lot of blank stares and shoulder shrugs and, um, but there was one woman who was intrigued by the story. She spoke a little bit of English and of course, Janice spoke a little bit of French uh, and, the women behind the counter kind of talked amongst themselves a little bit. They made a few phone calls. And after about 10 minutes, uh, the woman reported back. She said, yeah, you know something? There is one trail. It's on the edge of town. It's only one. There's only one trail. But, but be careful. It's really steep. So at that point, um, uh, we started following uh, some of the unmarked trails that went by a river. Uh, we started to get a little bit more excited when we went to the center of a small town called P, uh, PY, uh, and they had a map that was in the center of town that was behind glass, and it seemed to hit all of the road marks or the, 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 the markers that, that Nuzel had in his book, and we got more and more excited, and, and we knew at that point that we had, we had found the trail because there was only one trail out of town. It went straight through the mountains, and it went to Spain. So um, we are very excited that we found it. Uh, Stephanie, why don't you kind of flip through some of the slides now? This is the Algemeni. Uh, this is one of, the, uh, one of the streams that Virginia had to traverse uh, on her way to, uh, to freedom in Spain. This is, this is in France. Uh, next slide. Uh, this is in France also. It, it shows you a little bit of the ribbon of the trail. <clears throat> and uh, it's a little deceptive. It looks like it might be a nice kind of a uh, a stroll in the park, but it, this thing was, it was uh, on, the, on the edge of a, of a slope. Um, and you'd always have to be leaning towards the mountain in order to make it work. Uh, and of course you can see the train was a little bit rough uh, and uh, the altitude at this point was, was getting higher. I can only imagine what it was like in winter time. Uh, if you slipped, there was very little uh, to grab onto. Um, uh, next slide, uh, Stephanie. This was part of the trail uh, that led down the mountain uh, into Spain uh, from, uh, from the top of, uh, <clears throat> of uh, actually Picta Lodona, which is on the Spanish side. But it gives you an idea of the, of the, uh, the terrain. I'll, I'll show, I'm gonna show a movie now of, uh, this, is, <clears throat> this is kind of like um, uh, at the top of Picta Ladona from Spain, looking down into the valley that Virginia Hall had to traverse. 
Um, and if you stop right there, uh, Stephanie, yeah, that's good. Uh, if you see a mountain in the distance off to the left and you see a zigzag, that is the mountain that I took the original picture from going towards, towards Spain. Virginia traveled through this, uh, through this valley uh, and uh, through the town called Mantet. Uh, and this is, this is taking a look at it from, from, a, uh, from the, the, from the uh, Picta La Dona, which is on the Spanish side of the, of the Pyrenees. Okay, Stephanie, you can kind of continue. And, oh, no, 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 continue with the, with the uh, no, there we go. Uh, this is a picture of Lorna Catling. It's one of my favorite pictures. I, I, I love Lorna. She's, she's a great woman. She's, she's uh, Virginia Hall's niece, and she had something very nice to say about my book. I appreciated it very much. She said basically that uh, I knew Virginia better than the other authors, but we'll talk about that later. Um, again, this is, this is the slide. Why don't we take it right through to the end, uh, uh, Stephanie? That'll be great. There we go. Good, 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 good. And we'll take it up. Yep, you can see the upslope that, that Virginia had to, had to traverse in order to get uh, into, into, into Spain. Now, this is probably like mile 25. She had 25 more miles to go. If you stop right there, if you can. Yeah, she, she had to go over this mountain and down into the valley down there. And again, it's winter time. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> this is, this is, it gives you an example of the terrain up here. Uh, absolutely nothing to grab onto if you slip or if you fall. Uh, actually, we'll see on the side here, there's a, uh, there's a, there's a bit of a, uh, of a ski resort that now has been kind of created in this area. Yeah. And th this is, uh, again, this is, this is Lorna Catling. Um, and Lorna's, Lorna's a wonderful woman. Uh, and we had a good chance to talk a little bit about Virginia and, and uh, she had some nice things to say about my book. And, and uh, uh, it was, it was a, a, a great opportunity to learn more about uh, the personality of Virginia. And uh, frankly, uh, Virginia, as I, I could mention a little bit later, is, it was pretty much of a blank slate for a lot of people. Uh, there was a lot in the way of uh, information on, um, on her career. Uh, but not very much information at all about her, the person. Uh, we could talk about that a little bit later if, there, if there's interest. Um, that kind of concludes my presentation. I'd be glad to, to take any, any questions that people have about, uh, about uh, Virginia Hall and, and uh, her life and career in espionage. Thank you so much, Craig. Uh, I love that slide portion about the Freedom Trail. And of course, I salute anybody who turns their thesis into a published work. That is like a Freedom Trail in and of itself. So there's a special award for you for doing that. I salute you. Well, well done. You. Well done. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate You're welcome. That. Congratulations. So um, I have a, uh, some questions myself okay. and then I've got a few posted uh, in the chat as well but uh, the the first question that I have is something that uh, you and I I had just talked about very briefly why did you decide to write a historical fiction as opposed to uh, a biography or something in the non non-fiction realm what that's, was your that's thought? that's a really good question and uh, actually um, Virginia was a very difficult subject for anybody who is interested in trying to write about her. She was very much, as I mentioned, a blank slate. Um, and the only insight that you, we really had into her personality basically was what Lorna Catling had, had provided me and, and some of the other authors. Um, Lorna was basically what they call an old school spy. She, she was true to her secrecy agreement. She gave no interviews, wrote no memoir, spoke very little about her life overseas, uh, even to her friends and closest relatives. Uh, <clears throat> so, but authors, I think, bring their own background uh, in telling their story about Virginia. And there's some journalists, uh, you know, Sonia Purnell, uh, an excellent journalist who, who wrote a wonderful biography of Virginia Hall, which is from a journalistic perspective. I mean, her, her real specialty is research. 
There are also celebrities who, who write biographies, who, who bring their style and notoriety to, uh, to, to writing. But I wanted to use my experience as a, a senior CIA officer to, to reveal kind of Virginia Hall as, as the spy. Um, so my book is not a biography, uh, even though it's based on hundreds of documents. I chose to write something different that, that takes into account my, my background. Um, you know, I understand something through osmosis about, about uh, espionage and spy tradecraft, you know, dead drops, brush passes, uh, encoded messages, all of those kinds of things Virginia Hall used. And, and, you know, I've been to war zones in Iraq and Afghanistan, so I've seen uh, women agency officers in action. Um, and universally, I find them to be smart, tough, and confident. And that's kind of the person that I, I had Virginia portrayed as in my book. And that's the kind of person that I believe that, that she was. Uh, as I mentioned, I discovered the Pyrenees Trail. Uh, it was what Virginia had called the hardest thing she'd ever do was to hike the Pyrenees. And if I really wanted to understand Virginia Hall, the person, I had to, I had to in some ways experience some of the pain that she was experiencing. And, and believe me, as, as, a, as a runner, um, I have an understanding of, of difficult terrain and I cannot imagine what that was like for Virginia uh, dragging her prosthetic limb through, uh, through the snow 50 miles in three days. I'd also uh, interviewed a CIA psychiatrist who specializes in trauma, uh, the kind that Virginia Hall suffered. He was a member of Operation Iraqi Freedom so he, he had an understanding of, of prostheses and, and the different kinds of things that people go through, the psychological trauma as well as the physical trauma. Uh, and he offered insights into Virginia Hall's state of mind. Uh, so I wanted to use all of these kinds of experiences that I had um, to show Virginia Hall the person. And the only way I could do that was to write a book that, that used dialogue. Uh, and that's why basically I wanted to use again the sum total of, of my knowledge uh, to, to write a more personal kinds of story of that, that reimagined uh, Virginia Hall in these kinds of situations. So uh, that's what I did. And I decided to write a book that was historical fiction rather than a straight biography. One of the things that any uh, historical work, historical fiction uh, research has to be uh, usually quite extensive. And so I and someone else in the chat are interested in your research process because of course it's the archives that are so important and you, you had access to insights and things that others may not have had. But what do you do with the missing parts, with the gaps? How do you address that and the question from the audience was what were your struggles if any in particularly writing about a woman well again i think it comes up well um i'll take the last one first uh i was i you know i i struggled with with writing from a woman's perspective but i also had the advantage of of uh, shopping my uh, draft uh within johns hopkins uh so i was able to I purposely selected uh, a, a woman uh, as, as, one of, uh, as one of my instructors so that uh, in my workshop, I could, I could get the perspective of women. Uh, I also used um, or had a number of, of women uh, who worked at CIA be beta readers for me on the, uh, on the book as well, because I wanted to get uh, the woman case officer kind of feel for uh, what it was like to, um, to to work in an operational environment. So that's the that's the story of of how I, you know, and believe me, at, at Hopkins they wouldn't cut me any breaks uh, when it came to writing about a woman. So um, I, I I was totally on receive mode, uh, and it was based on my under my my views of of seeing women in in action uh, and so forth. So. That was, uh, that's the woman end of things. As, as far as the, as the research goes, I found it, I found that writing a historical novel actually allowed me to fill in some of the gaps, to create a story. A lot of times when you read biographies, it seems to be a little bit haphazard. It kind of, it, it's all driven by what, it's all driven by the data, driven by uh, the, what is available in the archive, you know, 
you know, if you don't have access to the, to the, to the Nazi archives, you're not going to necessarily get the full story of, of Virginia Hall. And there's always a little bit of a, of a, of a surface disconnect when it comes to some of those things. Um, so I found that, that um, having a, a gap uh, was not necessarily a problem uh, because I was, I was filling in with reimagined uh, kinds of interactions between people. Uh, the way I, pr uh, way I present the story is I, I tell people it's the arc of Virginia Hall's life. And what I wanted to do too is, is to also uh, get more into kind of like the feeling of what it's like to be uh, overseas in an, in an operational environment and, and what Virginia Hall must have gone through and, and so forth. So um, I did all the research that all of the biographers do, um, but I also sensed that there were, would be gaps and uh, I thought that uh, doing historical fiction would help me fill some of those gaps. What does it mean to for you to have decided to write in a female voice then? What what did it mean for me? Yeah, because if you're thinking about that, one of the question really was, uh, as I uh, read it again, the person who posted it said, not so much writing uh, about a woman, but in a female voice. Is there a distinction that you would draw there that you're really taking on the persona of a woman. That's, yeah, that's true. That's true. But it's, it's like a lot of writing. Once you, once you get into the craft and once you start imagining what it's like, it's like a whole different world opens up and you can see different kinds of situations and how people take a look at those situations. Um, I, you know, uh, it was challenging. It was challenging, but once once that flow comes, uh, it it almost becomes kind of a second nature in terms of seeing the world in a different way. I, it's very hard for me to describe, but it's, it's part of the creative process. I think it sounds like a good intellectual challenge uh, as well, and. Yeah. And I think that uh, when, so what about your sources and how did you fill in those gaps? What, what did you do to address all oh, that information's not there and draw a full, full bodied person? Well, you know, you do what you can. Um, you, you, um, you know, you, you do interviews, um, to, you know, and, and the, actually the psychiatrist to, you know, who, who had worked for the, the agency really provided me with a, a lot of different kinds of insights into what it was like, not, not just, you know, what it was like to, uh, to have a prosthetic leg. Um, you go to people who are experts, you go to, you go to see people who are kind of like the, the, the women case officers, you go to the people who, who understand what it's like to have a prosthetic leg, you, you, you do the research, you go to the people who and, and interview people uh, like Lorna Catling who have an understanding of the personality involved. And then it's, it's really a creative process and just kind of knitting it all together. And uh, the, actually the, the framework for the story of course is based on uh, historical documents. Uh, so there are things that you select and things that you don't select in those historical documents. And because you wanna create a story uh, that, is, that is interesting for people. And uh, again, it's, it's it's all, it's kind of like a, an eclectic stew that, that just come, all comes together and it's the creative process that, that knits all of these, these pieces of information together to, to create a, a work of historical fiction. Were there any uh, models of historical fiction or writing that you turned to or that you found that you said, ah, uh, or either a wonderful example of what to do or a wonderful example of what not to do? Well, um, actually, um, I'm more a reader of biography, believe it or not, than, than uh, historical fiction. Uh, so my book is, is more, it has a root, has the architecture of, of, uh, of nonfiction. Um, and then I lay on the, uh, the overcoating of, of the fictional uh, uh, aspects of it. 
I really like Ben McIntyre. You know, um, I've, I've just finished uh, Agent Sonia, which is which is excellent. I like the way that he uh, creates a whole story. Uh, he knits together. It's it's not just a this happened, then this happened, then this happened, then this happened. He knits it together in a way that is that is compelling, uh, a way that that identifies a personality, uh, and and a way that that. Uh, tells a story which is you know very compelling so uh, it's uh, I, I think the people that I, I focus on mostly are uh, actually the the biographers and uh, I thought I just kind of as my first my first book uh, I, I has the has the character of a biography but the overlaying of uh, of kind of a, a creative reimagining of, uh, of Virginia Hall's life based on a variety of different kinds of experiences and interviews that I've had with people. So these two, these questions may be related or maybe not. Um, so what, uh, one of the questions from the chat is uh, about other women who were spies during World War II. Uh, right. Were there others? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. In fact, uh, you know, <clears throat> uh, if, if you see the movie, A Call to Spy, uh, it, it, it Focuses on three women: Vera Atkins, uh, uh, Nor Khan, and Virginia Hall. Um, but uh, there are more women uh, out there. In fact, there were like 36 women who were of the SOE who were overseas in in, in France uh, during the Second World War, and they died basically at the same uh, the same numbers that men died. Um, uh, approximately a third of them didn't come back. A lot of them were. Uh, if once discovered, were were sent to uh, concentration camps where they died horrible deaths. So uh, these women uh, uh, did amazing things, and they were also uh, subject to the same kinds of of uh, tortures that that men were. Now, a lot of the women necessarily didn't have the same kinds of experiences that Virginia Hall had. Uh, Virginia was was a little bit of a uh, <clears throat> Was was a little bit of an outlier in some of those uh, some of those respects. A lot of women were couriers. A lot of women were were wireless operators. A lot of women were behind the scenes. A lot of it had to do, I think, with the fact that that men were chauvinists. Men didn't, you know, Virginia had had done so many things, and by the time that she went back the second time, she wasn't given a command position. She was number two, um, and she decided to uh, on her own. Uh, she knew that if she had uh, had uh, become a wireless operator, that she could kind of go anywhere that she wanted to go, and that was her idea. She wanted to to get over to France and then uh, then ditch the ditch the number one and become her own number one and work throughout the Haute Loire region. So the so there were uh, many women spying. It sounds like did uh, right. and how did you? Uh, begin your, where did your research begin? Uh, like, did you start with a particular archive or did you, start, and how did you branch out from there? And if anybody else is out there interested or, or doing their thesis, uh, where are they gonna go? And is it redacted? One of the people in the chat said that her mother was, uh, was in espionage and almost all of her paperwork is still redacted. Well, if we take that second one, uh, second question uh, first, um, I was involved in de uh, record declassification. So um, I knew what archives were available. All of the OSS documents, by the way, are declassified automatically. Uh, they've, they've already hit their, their time. Uh, and uh, once the CIA uh, redacts documents, they go directly to NARA, which is the, uh, the uh, records archive. Um, I, I would recommend that this woman um, uh, continue uh, to, to find and seek uh, ways of, of uh, getting additional uh, documents redacted. Now, as far as uh, where I started, uh, Virginia Hall was known as something of an icon at CIA. However, not too many people really knew too much about her. They, they were uh, they trot her out at uh, Women's Disability Month or Women's History Month or something like that, but they never really went into a lot of detail into what her her life and career actually was. And that kind of intrigued me because, you know, women's stories, of course, are undertold stories. So I thought that that this would be a, a good story to, to, to read. I had uh, access to the 
uh, basically the same documents that were in NARA, but oh, I had easier access to those documents. So <clears throat> that's where I started. And uh, that's why I started working on, on my thesis. And then it was, it, it, reading Virginia's story really kind of drew me in. It was the kind of thing that um, once I started, it was kind of like, wow, this is kind of, uh, kind of interesting. I've, I've got to, you know, I've, I've got to write to the, to the British archives and I've got to get those documents. And then it was, I've got to look at, at the, you know, do interviews with people and I've got to go to CIA archives and I've got to go to the US archives. I've got to, and then it just kind of took, took over from there. It's, I think part of it is, 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 a, is a passion to, to find out more about the story and to dig and dig and dig until you can have something that's interesting for people to read. So these are a couple of uh, specific questions. One of the impressions that I had about uh, women like Virginia, and, and probably this is true for men, is they tended to travel light. And by that, I mean, in terms of possessions, but also people. And uh, the question was, did, it, uh, did anyone travel with Virginia to Spain? Uh, and if, she, if so, who or? You know, how, how are those choices made? Do, do you have any insight into that? Yeah, uh, Virginia had, had sent a number of people over uh, the mountains. As, as being a, an espionage agent in, in Lyon, uh, there were a lot of downed aircraft people. Uh, there were a lot, of, uh, a lot of Jews that really, there were high placed uh, Jews that, that needed to get out of France. There were a number of, of uh, people in Vichy, uh, France, who were Frenchmen who uh, had bounties on their heads. So Virginia's responsibility, uh, part of her responsibility was not only to break these people out of jail, but it was to send them over the mountains. So she was familiar with uh, the route um, that, uh, or she's familiar with the people. Let's not, let's put it that way. She didn't necessarily know what the, what routes were open or closed based on what the Gestapo was up to. Uh, but, uh, but she managed to identify um, and she went through uh, the same people that she had uh, sent other people through. Uh, and there was, there was a, an Australian and another Frenchman who also traveled with Virginia uh, over the Pyrenees uh, into, uh, into Spain uh, that time. Uh, and uh, actually, Sonia Purnell does an excellent job in tracking down all those relatives and, and so forth and, and, uh, and providing insights into who these people were. Um, I just basically identified who they were and then wrapped them into my story. So um, Virginia, if you're looking for a pure historical view of Virginia Hall um, without a lot of the baggage, uh, Sonia Purnell's book is, is very good. So I know we're at the top of the hour and uh, Craig, I don't know if you have just a few more minutes. Uh, it's okay if you don't, uh, sure. we respect people's sure. uh, time. and. Folks, uh, we said this before, but if you uh, have to go, we are recording, so we will post this uh, author interview at a later date on our YouTube channel. Uh, so don't worry if you have to head on now, it's okay. You'll still get to hear the answers to Craig's questions. So Craig, this uh, question uh, is about what are, you, is, what are you working on now? And I was thinking it might be related to all these other spies. Are you done with spies? I, I'm not so uh, sure. Uh, no, I'm, I'm, I'm not. Uh, in fact, I'm working on one right now. I don't wanna to talk too much about what it is because I'm not sure exactly where the research is gonna take me. But there was one spy, actually a Polish spy in the, in the uh, who was working in place for uh, for the CIA for for three years before he came out? And this was this was at kind of like the heyday of the the Cold War, the early 1960s. Um, I, I've just contacted, and the the Polish secret police is going to be sending me a trove of documents. Hopefully, they're all going to be in Polish, so I'm going to have to find a, a Polish interpreter or or uh, or you know spend a lot of time with my my buddy uh, uh, Google translate uh, in order to, to get these things done. Uh, but uh, uh, I, I find that um, the, the further I'm away from actual working at the agency, the more I kind of am interested. You know, when I, when I worked at the agency, I really wasn't, didn't really didn't care too much about this kind of stuff. But now I find it kind of fascinating. I'm kind of wishing that I had, had done more, you know, to kind of learn more when I was there. But uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's a fascinating kind of thing to do. And it, it, 
keeps me uh, intellectually active and I, I enjoy writing very much. So uh, it's, it's one of my passions. Well, I read a was I read a book over the weekend, and there, and I'm going to paraphrase an Ernest Hemingway quote uh, that writing is easy. Just sit down at the typewriter and bleed. It doesn't <laughs> sound like you're bleeding. It sounds like you're enjoying this way too it, much for Ernest it, Hemingway's taste. So how could this be that you're such a a happy writer? What, what's I, your secret? Tell us about. I, your I love I love the struggle. <laughs> I love the struggle. I I, I just. You know Hemingway is is perhaps my uh, my 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 greatest idol when it comes to uh, comes to writing because he's so crisp and precise and uh, his his imagery is wonderful um, and uh, you know I I just I just love to write and uh, even though it's you know it's it's a strenuous job and the first draft is horrible and you know you you gotta you know, you say, wow, this, this really stinks. You know, nobody's gonna be interested in this thing. You always try to figure out, ultimately, the most important thing is not to be boring. You know, if you can't be good, be short and don't be boring. So uh, that's, that's kind of like my motto and that's what kind of like I go after. Did you, in your, in your writing classes, uh, Johns Hopkins, did you come across any, uh, books on writing or anything that you thought, ah, that, that really shaped me? Uh, there are a number of books. Um, they're downstairs on my shelf and I, I refer to them, but uh, I, <clears throat> I don't have any in, in mind in particular. There's, there's one book actually by, uh, it was edited, uh, Hemingway's writing. Um, and it's, it's all about writing based, based on Hemingway's kind of thoughts. And uh, I find that to be pretty interesting. Um, but the most important thing is not to do a lot of reading about it, it's just to get down to it. What's your, what's your pro, like how do you structure yourself? Are you just a free wheeler, as they call it, a pantser? What do you do, what do you do? Uh, actually, you know, now that I'm getting a little bit older, I find that my energy level is really high in the morning to do, uh, to do writing and to do more intellectual work. And uh, in the afternoon, I go for a run. I mean, you know, that's it. And, and uh, actually, you know, something during this pandemic, um, uh, writing, you know, actually, a pandemic is not a is not as difficult a challenge for a writer who's used to solitary working environments than for for other folks. So, I find that uh, it's uh, it it causes me to buckle down a little bit more. So when you, you've got some other people who like Sonia Purnell, who've, who've written about this subject, and there, you're right that there's a lot of interest in Ben McIntyre's book and uh, AJ Sonia, there's, a, you know, he's uh, definitely, a, a, you're, you've, you're in a, a great, in great company. So what is it that attracts people, first of all, to Virginia's story? And why this, why do you think there's this interest, this, this resurgence uh, and almost a renaissance, I guess I would say, an in interest in the, in the spy, the CIA, maybe the role of women, what's going on there? Any, any thoughts there? I, I think part of it is, is the times that we're living in. I think that uh, uh, in the past, history has been written by older white men. And I think uh, people are looking for more interesting stories. You know, we've kind of hashed through as much as the old old white guys can can tolerate. And now we're we're moving into a, an era, <clears throat> and maybe it's the times, maybe it's the the uh, the nineteenth, you know, centennial of the nineteenth amendment that starts to get people to thinking more about women's stories. Um, y you know, I, I think that uh, you know organizations like the CIA are doing more in the way of hiring women. Uh, I, I've got to think that uh, that that these stories are on the ascendancy. And I think that people are interested in, uh, in knowing more and it, it, and it just makes sense. You know, I mean, everybody wants to, everybody wants to, to have somebody that, that is like them, that they can kind of imagine who, what they're like. Uh, and uh, so I, th I think it's a, it's a combination of factors that, uh, that are, that are, are bringing, now uh, why spy stories? I think spy stories have always been interesting for a lot of people, I, because there's, there's always an element of, of what's behind the facade. You know, what, what are people really driving at? Who really is this person after all? 
And people are interested in personal stories, personal stories of people. And that's kind of one of the reasons why I wrote uh, Hall of Mirrors and, and did it as a, again, as a, as a historical fiction, because <clears throat> I, I try to peel back the layer of, of, uh, of who Virginia Hall is. And, uh, and these stories are, are finally coming to the fore. Uh, one of the, the things that I really am interested in that you said is that uh, there's more women being that are hired now. So that tells me that the makeup, the, the uh, cohorts who are serving in espionage and serving in the ranks of, uh, you know, the spies, I guess, if you want to use it in that way, are changing. So how do you think the stories of spies are changing? What, what well, I think if we're going to project into the future, we're just going to do a little hypothetical. What do you sure. think it's going to be like? It's, it's sure, it's, it's not only uh, who's doing the spying, but it's the technology of the spying that is, that is important these days. I think a lot of it has to do with, now cyber is very important. Um, you know, I think that, uh, you know, uh, whereas there were a lot of dead drops and other kinds of things in the past, now it's burst communications and, and other kinds of agent communications kind of uh, technologies. So it's, it's a different kind of, uh, of a world that we're living in right now. And it's, it's a real challenge to, to keep it on the personal level, because I think a lot of these technologies are kind of, uh, in some ways, removing, removing people from, uh, from interactions. And basically, you know, that's the way that spies operate. They operate hoping that they don't have to be in, in communication or in contact, direct contact with people, because that's when, uh, that's when people get rolled up. So what's it like uh, watching a, a person that you studied so, so um, intently make it to the big screen or to the little screen in the pandemic times? <clears throat> uh, what's that like? Did, did you think that that process works well? How does it, does it serve uh, us or not? Well, because, because Virginia Hall was much of a blank slate, I think that that gives that gives actors and actresses kind of an, a, a a free reign to uh, to portray Virginia Hall in different kinds of ways. Um, I think that Sarah Megan Thomas does a great job as Virginia Hall. She portrayed Virginia Hall as kind of like a woman of steel, but also someone who's capable of, of sharing emotion. Um, uh, and uh, it's different difficult for me to. To, to see other people being portrayed as Virginia Hall when I have my own my own biases about who Virginia Hall was and and how she acted in uh, in in real life, but uh, it's it's I think it's most important that the story of Virginia Hall get out. So I think that that is the important thing. Um, how she's portrayed is is uh, is a variety of different kinds of, of uh, subject to a variety of different kinds of interpretation. But uh, I think that, that Virginia Hall, uh, uh, Virginia Hall story is is one of incredible courage that uh, that uh, can can serve as a model for for men and women. Uh, you you uh, encouraged us to direct people to your blog because you post uh, quite a bit. You're very active on your blog. So Stephanie's very kindly uh, put a link to Craig's blog uh, about Virginia Hall uh, that's on his website. And I encourage you to go there to see uh, for uh, his updates and more information. So uh, I kind of teased this a little bit. I was wondering if you might have a memoir that you're going to write. <laughs> Uh, I'm right now. I'm just kind of collecting my um, my experiences, and uh, I don't know how or when or if any of that stuff is going to be surfacing in a <clears throat> in a in any kind of a, a memoir or anything so uh, uh, so prestigious as a memoir. It very well, might be something I circulate to family members and uh, and my son, and, and maybe that'll be it. But, you know, I, I love to write and uh, I wouldn't put it out of the realm of possibility. Well, I certainly would want to read it because you, you've had a fascinating kind of insider's uh, set of experiences that I don't think a lot of people really uh, may may know much about and uh, you may not be able to tell a whole lot, but nonetheless, it's, it sounds like a, a very rich and rewarding uh, career. And I would certainly, uh, I, I hope you'll do it. 
uh, because you're so happy. As long as it makes you happy. Yeah, I, you know, I, I, I've, I've got to tell you, uh, Patricia, that uh, I loved working at the CIA. I, I, you know, it was like a kid in a candy store. It, it 34 years went by in a flash, and it was so interesting. And the people, they made me better than I ever could be myself. And that was that's. Uh, I, I'm not sure I'd get in the agency right now if, <laughs> if I were a new recruit, uh, but I, I was just so happy and so pleased to be part of that organization and so proud to be part of the organization and, uh, and the people, of course, within it. Sold. I think, I think there you go. That, that, that tells me right there, this memoir must happen and I, and I really hope you do it. <laughs> it's, uh, Craig, it's been uh, a delight. I've learned so much. I'm so glad that you and your wife went on that trail because right. that, uh, that to me is the boots on the ground that tells us something about the lived experience of someone uh, who we really couldn't have understood in, in such a personal way unless you'd done that and taken that on. And uh, not, not all authors do that. So I'm really, really glad that, that you did that. It's, it, it enriches the, your book and it enriches our understanding of Virginia Hall and what it means to do that with uh, a prosthetic limb. I can't yeah. even imagine, but I know a little better now from what you've told us this evening. Well, and I want to encourage everyone to take a, take some time to go to Craig's website and also to at their independent bookstore, I get a copy of Hall of Mirrors. You can see my uh, kitten is sneaking into the frame. It's not a Zoom event without a cat folks, just <laughs> deal with it, right? Um, exactly. And so I, Craig, congratulations. And I can't wait to read your next book on the Polish thing. I don't know which, where you're going with that, but. I wish I knew too. I just hope that the, uh, the, the files turn out to be what I hope them to be. I hope so too. Get yourself a good translator and buckle down. Right? May I say one last thing? I would love it if you did. I would like people to know that uh, signed copies of Hall of Mirrors are available at Malaprops. <laughs> yes. <laughs> So we've got signed copies. If you order uh, from Malaprops, you can call us or you can go online. You can request a signed copy of Hall of Mirrors. We don't charge more for that. So it's just, a, it's just another element of the personal uh, connection that you have to the author. And in this case, Craig's great book, Hall of Mirrors. Uh, Craig, I wanna thank you again. Uh, my little kitty Pearl says, thank you, Craig. And uh, Stephanie, thank you so much for your help. Uh, we all appreciate you uh, so much, Craig, and your great work. Stay cheerful and uh, keep on writing, okay? Stay safe. Thank you. you. Stay safe too. Good night. Good night. <laughs>